Okay, and problem 21 is asking for which of the following is a solution to the differential equation dy dx is equal to e to the y plus x power. And we got the initial condition that y of 0 equals the negative natural log of 4. Okay, so in this problem, you're going to want to um, use integration. So let's first rewrite this side as e to the x or e to the y times e to the x using the, one of the properties of exponents. And then we're going to send the y to the left and the e to the right. So we're going to have 1 over e to the y dy is equal to e to the x dx. And then we're going to integrate. So um, we're going to get this is integral. And we're going to rewrite this as e to the negative y dy is equal to the integral of e to the x dx. Now from here, integrating e to you know a variable is super easy because it's pretty much the same thing, except in this case, you're just going to need to divide by negative 1. So you're going to have e to the negative y times negative 1, or divided by negative 1, same thing. And that'll be equal to e to the x. And let's not forget our constant constant integration, so plus c. Now, um, from here, we're going to need to use this initial condition. But let's find, let's solve for y. We're going to solve for y by taking the natural log of each side. But first, let's get rid of this negative, because it's going to make it easier to work with. So we're going to divide, we're going to make this just e to the negative y is equal to negative e to the x. And, and we're just going to, instead of saying minus c, we're just going to call this c1, and we're going to have a different constant. Because it's going to be just, an, it's just still going to be another constant. It doesn't really matter. It'll be more confusing if you make it minus c than when you're solving for the constant integration. It's not going to exactly match up. OK, now what we do is take the natural log of each side. So we're going to take the natural log of e to the negative y. And that will be equal to the natural log of negative e to the x. plus c2. Now that allows us to um, use the logarithm properties so we can move the exponent as a coefficient. And so we basically got negative y times the natural log of e is equal to this whole thing, the natural log of negative e to the x plus c2. Natural log of e is just equal to 1. So it becomes very simple. That's just 1. And so we, get, we got negative y, so we'll make it just, we'll divide it by negative. So we'll get the y equals negative natural log of negative e to the x plus c2. Now from here, we can plug in the initial condition. So um, we're going to put 0 in for x. And we're going to make the negative natural log of 4 for y. So we're going to have the negative natural log of 4 is equal to the negative natural log of negative e to the 0 plus c2. And now, see, so we, got, we got both negatives. So all we're really doing is solving the inside. We're solving the inside. 4 is equal to negative e to the 0 plus c2. Remember, e to the 0 is just 1. So all you have is 4e to negative, or 4 equals negative 1 plus c2. So you're, then your constant is going to be, your constant of integration is 5. Now that you know your constant of integration, you can just re-substitute that into here. And you're going to get your equation for y. So you'll get that y is equal to the negative natural log of negative e to the x plus 5. Now the answer should be some form of, some form of this. 
Let's see, we got exactly right here. So C. Their answer is C. All right, 26. Okay, so which of the following is the antiderivative of the square root of one plus x cubed? Now this one is actually pretty simple if you recognize that this just this is just an application of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. I mean, you can technically just check each one and take the derivative. Um, and they try to trick you because they try to make you forget about the quotient rule here and the power rule and the, or the chain rule. And so they try to make you think it's either one of these. And, um, you know, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're really testing you. But remember the um, second fundamental theorem of calculus says that if you're integrating from zero to X of F of T DT, you're just, your answer is just gonna be F of X. So this will just be E, because all you're basically doing is you're gonna substitute that X for the T here, and then you're gonna get that. So the answer is E. All right, 27, for time greater than or equal to zero, the height H of an object is suspended from a spring that is given by H of T equals 16 plus seven cosine of pi T over four. What's the average height of the object from t equals zero to t equals two? Okay, so this is gonna be, you know, basically an application of the average value theorem. So what you do is you basically just take the, the interval length and multiply by that or divide by that with however you wanna see it. Um, so you're gonna take one half. If you remember, it's, you know, one over B minus A times integral from A to B of whatever that function is. So that b minus a is the b minus the b minus a is the distance from you know two to zero. So it's just one half, and we're going to integrate from zero to two of this function. Sixteen plus seven cosine of pi t over four. Okay, so then we just got to make sure we got our antiderivatives down. So we have one half. Antiderivative of 16 will be 16t plus 7. Let's take that 7 out for now. The antiderivative of the cosine function is the sine function. I mean, the inside will always stay there. And we have to make sure that we use basically like the opposite of the chain rule. So instead of multiplying by the derivative of pi t over 4, you're gonna divide by the derivative of pi t over four. So it's essentially, you're gonna basically divide by pi over four. And this whole thing will be integrated from zero to two. And so what happens here is you're gonna get one half times integral of 16t plus 28 over pi sine of pi t over four from zero to two. And then we just gotta make sure we know our trigonometry, so one half Plug in two, so 16 times two, 32, plus 28 over pi. Times the sine of two pi over four, or the sine of just one half pi. Minus, Plug zero in, minus, remember zero, that just becomes zero. 28 over pi times the sine of zero. And this is gonna fall away because the sine of zero is zero and zero is zero. So this part doesn't really even matter. That thing you can ignore. So what you really have is one half 
times 32 plus 28 over pi times the sine of 1 half pi, which you should know is just 1. So all you have is 28, um, 28 over pi plus 32, and then probably going to get a weird. Yeah, OK. I'm, you're going to get some weird answer here. So you're going to get just 1 half times that. So 16 plus 14 over pi should be the answer. Yeah, so the answer will be D. All right, the last one of this multiple choice section. OK, so we got the function f of x is equal to sine of x plus cosine of x um, on 0 to 2 pi. So what's the x-coordinate of the point of inflection where the graph of f changes from concave down to concave up? So remember, concavity deals with the second derivative. So we're going to calculate the second derivative and then to figure out when it's concave up and concave down. And that's basically just looking at the sign of the second derivative. When it's positive, the second derivative is concave up. When it's negative, it's gonna be concave down. And I don't mean second, I mean the function is concave up and the function is concave down. Um, so let's first find f prime of x. That'll be cosine of x minus sine of x. Then let's find f double prime of x. That'll be the negative sine of x minus the cosine of x. And then we have to find the possible inflection points. So we have to find where f double prime of x is undefined or where it's zero. So we can find where it's zero. You said zero equal to negative sine of x minus the cosine of x. And they're basically just going to be, um, you know, the opposites of each other. You want it because in order for them, to, you want them to cancel each other out because that's how you get zero. So where do they, where are the, um, so where are sine and cosine opposites on the unit circle? And you should know it'll be at three fourths pi and seven fourths pi. So you got to basically check at those intervals or at those points. Like, so we're going to break our interval up at three fourths pi and seven fourths pi. And then we want to see what the second derivative is doing there. So then we just pick a value in here. We'll just pick again pi over pi over two. And here we'll pick pi. Here we can pick um so these big ones will be um seven fourths pi. I'll probably you have to go fifteen. Um, my name is Alan. We only have to you don't have to check this far, but. Um, 15, 16, 15, or 11 twelfths pi is what I meant. 11 twelfths pi is what you normally learn. Anyways, so let's just let's check here first. So um, f double prime of pi over 2. We only really care about the sign. So f double prime of pi over 2. So we're going to take the negative sine of pi over 2 the negative sine of pi over two, sine of pi over two is one. So we got negative one minus the cosine of pi over two, which is just zero. So you get negative one. So since it's negative, so we know it's gonna be concave down. Our function is gonna be concave down. And then we find, let's find what um, S double prime of pi is. So the negative sine of pi, the negative sine of pi, sine of pi is just zero, so that's just going to be zero, minus the cosine of pi. Cosine of pi is negative one, so minus negative one, so that'll be positive one. So we got a positive number. Here we got a negative, 
So it's concave up in here. So right there, it changes from concave down to concave up um, right at three pi over four. So we, we, got our, we found our answer. So the answer will be B. And there you go, that's section one down.